The few verses are from Psalm 139. I think it's a very basic message this morning. Not the least bit controversial, I don't think. Although we're surprised what's controversial nowadays that didn't used to be. But, uh, 139 Psalm and verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Fearfully and wonderfully made. With a little insight into the natural world, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Somebody hasn't dusted. With a little insight into the natural world, we can see something of the design behind creation. And how much more hope do we have who believe in divine design than those who put creation and all its wonders down to mere chance or accident of circumstances. And we can clearly see around us the perfect and amazing way in which nature has been tuned to work. Bearing in mind, of course, we live in a fallen world. Things don't work as they should. Many of us know that in our own bodies. As a result of the fall and the entry into the world of sin, things don't work as they should. When we look around the world, we see a world that is now imperfect, and we read news from all over the world about all kinds of things happening in nature in these days. Not, not all of them are entirely natural, I suspect. And there's, you know, people say, oh, climate change is causing fires. Hot temperatures don't naturally make everything burst into flames. The Africans have had hot temperatures for many years, and they don't have fires all the time. There's something going on behind the scenes which isn't entirely natural. I think that's fairly clear. But the natural world has fallen. But even so, we can see how wonderful it still is. We can only imagine how wonderful it was when it was created and how wonderful the new heavens and the new earth will be. This understanding of the Creator God is a far broader subject than simply the matter of the first chapters of Genesis. It's rather the very bedrock of our Christian faith. Because without the firm assurance of biblical creation, the New Testament of salvation becomes invalid. The supposedly scientific theory of evolution is based entirely on chance and on the likelihood of things just happening to come together. Looking around at the wonders of the natural world, even as they are today, and reading of the incredible things that birds and animals can perfectly accomplish, many of things that we can't do, I say that the idea of it coming about by accident is ridiculous. Incidentally, unscientific. It's on a par with taking three old cars, crushing them up, breaking them into pieces and throwing them into a skip, then chucking in a hand grenade, waiting for the bang, and finding a fully functioning Sea King rescue helicopter sitting there in his place. And it's about as likely. Whereas Darwin's ideas had something going for them, and a lot of what he said was very sensible, which helps to lead people into error, you know, error isn't dangerous as long as it's clearly error. But when you have something that starts off good and sensible and then leads gently into error, that's much more dangerous, particularly in the Christian churches. But Darwin's ideas had something going for them. For instance, the idea of adaptation of species within their own limits and what has become known as the survival of the fittest 
a theory which incidentally goes against the general theory of evolution. Uh, Darwin actually contradicted himself there. there. There is absolutely no evidence for the evolution of one species into another different species. There's no evidence that that has ever happened. This teaching is much more of a religious nature than scientific because its adherents, including some very famous names from the BBC, essentially manufacture a faith of their own. They make it up and they call it science. And people are blinded by that word science. Oh, well, if it's science, it must be right. We had it all in the pandemic, don't we? Didn't we? Now we have it with climate change. When the scientists get going, people tend to bow in adoration. The scientists must know better. But nature has its own proof of a designer. And the natural system is a closed circuit of perfect counterbalancing and interconnecting smaller systems, even though they're fallen and they don't work properly anymore. But everything in nature has a point and a purpose, and they are designed to work together. Some are very obvious, like there's a particular species of hummingbird that has a particular kind of beak, extremely long beak, so much that it has to sit at night with its head down. If it puts its head up, it'll fall off the branch because its beak is so long, it's too heavy to hold. Why would it have such a silly beak? Because it feeds from one particular species of plant. It's the only bird that can feed from that plant, and that, that plant is the only one that can sustain the bird, and that bird is the only one that can pollinate the plant. It works perfectly well, and without the two of them working together, neither of them would be able to exist. Other purposes are not so clearly seen, particularly when you're thinking of spiders and other creepy crawlies and wasps, but without every individual section within it, the whole natural ecosystem would not survive. Creation is multi-layered, and each layer cannot exist without the other layers, something which negates the idea that the act of creation itself took millions and millions of years. Without beetles to break down the dead wood, for the goodness to be returned to the soil, without fungi to break down waste material, without an army of microorganisms all working together in their own slot, then plants and trees and fish and the higher creatures would not be able to survive. It all works together. And if you remove the animals at the top, then the rest of the ecosystem becomes unbalanced. If I can use a word that's much misused nowadays, it becomes unsustainable. Wolves, for instance, just to choose one, wolves have had a very bad press. I love wolves. I love bears and I love wolves. And, uh, but they've had a bad press. They were exterminated, eradicated from Britain in the 1700s. So Jeff remembers seeing one cross the road on his way to school one morning, but most of us won't remember them. But they hung on in the United States for some time longer, but they were eventually shot and hunted and poisoned almost to extinction. And it was found that when wolves were removed from Yellowstone National Park, which was the first national park in America, actually the first national park in the world, then the ecosystem, which would have been subordinate to the wolves, began to suffer. Every part of Yellowstone's ecosystem started to go downhill. It started to degrade. This was basically because without wolves at the top as predators, then the deer and the elk and the moose and all the other things, the other herbivores, the things that eat grass and plants, they flourished in such huge numbers that they started to eat all the buds and all the grasses and all the flowers, degrading the environment in which they lived and making the National Park a difficult place for creatures further down the chain. It's actually called tr a trophic cascade. You knew that, didn't you, Joan? It's called a trophic cascade. When you take the creature at the top, the wolf or the bear or whatever it is, whichever part of the world you're in, take that away, the whole system below it starts to degrade. When wolves were very controversially returned to Yellowstone National Park, after several years, the number of deer were lowered and stabilized, because unfortunately for them, they got eaten, so it wasn't so good for them. But the rest of the system started to recover. Because the ecosystem is a sealed unit, none of which can stand alone. We have an ecosystem of 
or world environment which works together. And it can't, if you take bits of it out, it starts to fall apart. Everything had to be started off already working. That's my point. Not all exactly at the same time, but within a very short space of time, already working. It's the same today for us with some of the organs in our bodies. Some of us know that bits don't work properly and we struggle with that. But for instance, your eye can only function as an eye if the whole of the eye is there working together as a functioning unit. If you needed so many years for your eye to form, you would be blind. It would be completely useless unless it was whole and completely functioning. And the system as a whole, as it was created perfectly, worked together uh, only because it was all together. And a humanity is part of it. And we should seek to live as Christians in a way which benefits nature as a whole. In other words, we shouldn't chuck our plastic bags into the environment and we should be careful what we do because we are custodians of this world and we should seek the best for it. But it's also higher. Man is also higher than the rest of creation because man was the only creature into which a living spirit was God-breathed. That's what makes all the difference. So that's where Psalm 139 describes as fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't know whether you feel fearful, I know I'm looking at you too, but whether you feel fearfully and wonderfully made just at this moment. I have days when I don't feel fearfully and wonderfully made at all. But I read Psalm 139 and it reminds me of the truth. Because remember, we don't go by what we feel. We don't go by our circumstances or the news we've had or what we hear from on the news. We go by what God says and what he says about himself and what he says about us fearfully and wonderfully made the creation story is not just restricted to the first chapters of Genesis the New Testament refers to it and relies upon it Acts chapter 17 verse 24 tells us God made the world and all things therein so to deny the truth of Genesis is to further deny the truth of the book of Acts because the book of Acts relies upon it. And therefore, if you disbelieve the truth of Genesis, you're disbelieving the apostles. In the Gospel of Matthew 19, verse 4, Jesus himself is recorded as saying, He which made them at the beginning, male and female. Said it wasn't going to be controversial, didn't I? That, that, who would have thought that that statement would, have been, would be controversial? Ten years ago, who would have thought there'd be any controversy in saying that God made them male and female. And that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible teaches, and it's still true. So we see that Christ himself believed the Genesis account. Therefore, to put oneself at odds with Genesis, as some Christians do, is actually to set oneself against the Savior himself. Because the Savior pointed to the truth of what Genesis was teaching. So Genesis is an important foundation. If you pursue the theory of evolution, and remember it's only a theory, that's all it ever has been, and it's an unimproved theory still today, and many scientists no longer believe it, they've totally discarded the whole idea. But if you pursue it to its ultimate end, you end up with the Nazis murdering all those humans that they felt were of an inferior race. That's where you go if you take the theory of evolution to its eventual end. The truth is that you this morning are where you are with a design and with a purpose which was decided by the Lord way back in prehistory. Your life is not just an accidental coming together of cells and hormones. It's a fearfully and wonderfully made thing and it's held in the palms of God's hand. In Jeremiah 1 verse 5, God speaks to his servants with these words, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee. This is what he repeats today to each and every one of his beloved children. 
you as a believer in Christ, which I trust you are, I know most of you, I think some of them are Christians, <laughs> but I know most of you, I don't know everybody, I'm trusting that you are a believer in Christ this morning. If you are, then you were sanctified and ordained before you knew anything about it. There had to come a point in your life where you had to give your heart to the Lord Jesus. You had to repent of your sins and allow him to become personal Lord and Savior. But the process started a long time before you ever knew about it. Creation teaching brings a purpose and a meaning to our lives. Sometimes our lives take an unexpected turn. And our circumstances are sometimes not wholly conducive to seeing a connected plan. But the scriptures tell us that we are made with a purpose as people and we are enlivened with a spiritual purpose as born again Christians. Not only are we wonderfully and marvelously made, but twice over. If you're putting your trust in the Lord this morning, then there is no part of your life or existence or experience which is not fully under the control and the guiding hand of the Creator who became your Redeemer. At Calvary, when Christ shed his blood for you, you were bought with a price to serve with a purpose. It's not always easy, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not always easy to understand the purposes of God. His ways are higher and greater and deeper than ours. He sees things from before the beginning of time to after the final culmination. Whereas we only see our little bit and it often gets cloudy and stormy and windy. And we don't always see clearly. In fact, we don't always see. You read something in the scripture and you don't always see the truth that's staring you in the face because your vision is blurred by your circumstances. Only perhaps later when somebody points it out to you or the Lord deals with you specifically, you suddenly see something and think, why didn't I see that before? Because I wasn't looking at it with the right eyes. Even when it's written down in front of you, sometimes it's difficult to fully understand because our vision is limited. I was traveling somewhere on the way out in the far west coast of Ireland years ago now, when the far west coast of Ireland was still a little bit primitive. And uh, I had a, in those days you had a radio and a CD in your car. You don't get things like that nowadays, dear. It's all very old-fashioned stuff. I was listening to the local radio, somewhere way out, either Mayo, Connemara, or Cork, somewhere way out there. And it's a very primitive local radio, and they, they announce people's funerals and things on the radio. Or well, they did then in the far west of Ireland. And, you know, the, the news was very much local. And the chap said he was going to play a piece of music, and it was dedicated to Mr. So-and-so, it's his birthday, and he's 111. And they played this piece of music, and I'm driving along the lanes listening to this piece of music. I can't remember what it was. And they fancy being 111. I bet everybody was thinking the same thing. Who is this man that's 111? And then the music finished, and the guy came back on, and he said, I have to apologize to you. Mr. So-and-so isn't 111. He's ill. <laughs> we understand what happened there. So that, that actually happened. I was driving the car when the, the guy had to come on and apologize because somebody had pushed a piece of paper in front of him and written 111. He thought it was 111 and it was actually ILL. -L. So he wasn't 111, he was ill. What was put right in front of the guy was not necessarily what he understood it to mean. We don't always get a clear view of eternity because our minds are finite and they are constricted by our human understanding. But by rooting our faith on the Bible, we see there the clearest crystal teaching that the Lord has a purpose for each one of us. All that is required of us is faith and obedience. And I say all. <laughs> it's a big thing, faith and obedience. Two of the biggest things we have to contend with, but that's all that's required of us. Because if we build on a solid foundation, then what is built will last. If we have the right anchor, 
then it will secure us through any number of storms. I've just passed a significant birthday. Seems ages ago. I've had three three birthdays this this time round. Haven't had a birthday for ten years. So I made the most of this one. Three birthdays in three different churches, and I do thank you very much for your very generous gift that you gave me uh, when I was last here for that birthday celebration. But at this time round, having a zero on the end somehow seemed more significant to me than the other zeros had done. I'm not sure why, but I was feeling you know this is significant time in my life, a lot of time has gone. I used to listen to somebody who I think was in his late 70s and he used to say, I know I've got less time ahead of me than I have behind me. And I thought, I'm beginning to feel like that myself now. You know, but I'm middle, I'm still only middle-aged. If I live to 120, I'm middle-aged. But I found a song, I'd never heard it before. And it was just the time when I was changing the zero at the end of my age. So it was particularly significant to me at the time. And I played it in a church a couple of weeks ago on the big screen. And several people said that they'd been touched by it. And it's an old song, but I'd not heard it before. But it's called The Anchor Holds. And the word, part of it says, I was young, but I'm older now. And that's what struck me because I was thinking very seriously about getting older. I was young, but I'm older now. And the chorus says, the anchor holds, though the ship is battered. The anchor holds, though the sails are torn. I have fallen on my knees when I faced the raging seas. But the anchor holds, despite of the storm. And that's where we are as Christian believers, if we put our trust in the Lord, fully and absolutely in the Lord. Whatever storms we go through, whatever comes against us in this world, it is after all but for a short time, but the anchor will hold. Without that anchor on which to hold in all the storms of life, which is often our usual experience, then I personally would find life pointless without reward and without hope. If I believed David Attenborough and the BBC, I would have no hope. If I believed Greta Thunberg, I'd be even worse off. There is no hope in the teaching that they bring to the world. They bring an empty, desolate message that your life is just an accident and has no point or purpose. Is it any wonder that people commit suicide under those circumstances? If I believed what they teach, I would think that life had no purpose. To believe that I'm an accidental result of colliding atoms with no purpose and no future is to take away the very foundation of spiritual life itself. Romans 8.28 is a verse which is often quoted, I'm sure you know it, but it's often only quoted in part, and we're interested in the second part, which is often missed out. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. The second part, to them who are called according to his purpose. That's the essential part. By trusting in faith in the Lordship of Christ, His personal forgiveness of our personal sins and His being our heavenly Redeemer, we are being called according to His purpose. That's who that verse is for. If you are called according to His purpose, as the Scripture teaches, then all things work together for good. And that purpose does not stop or decline until you're lifted up to glory in the heavenly realm. When he either calls us home or comes for us. We had read earlier too as Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 of that says in the AV in whom we have obtained an inheritance according to the purpose of of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory. So you get there a clear statement about the purpose 
for your life. You are meant to be. You are designed to be. You are redeemed to be to the praise of his glory. Are you? Is the question, isn't it? Am I? Is the big question. Is my life to the praise of his glory? That's a big responsibility. It's a tremendous blessing, but it's a big responsibility. It's a responsibility that some believers can't handle. God says, recorded in Jeremiah 29, from verse 12, uh, 22, this is what God says, and he says it now just as much as he ever did then. I know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then you shall call upon me, and I will hearken to you, and you shall seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. We have an expected end. We don't know what it is. But he does. In other words, we have an ordained purpose. And when we seek the Lord with all our hearts, we will begin to move into the place of understanding. And when you've been saved for 75 or 80 years, you're still just beginning to move into that place of understanding. Jeremiah's recording of these words is for our benefit because it describes the position of the born-again believer. I know it was written in the Old Testament, but it describes the position of the New Testament born-again believer. But the following verses that follow on immediately from that in Jeremiah uh, refer specifically to God's people Israel. And they proclaim they're being gathered from all the nations and returned to their own land. Prophecy which has been and is being fulfilled in our time. Meaning that our own divine purpose is soon to come to fruition. The signs are all around us. We've heard some of that this morning already. The purpose that was set in motion at creation came to one part of its fulfillment when Christ died on Calvary and rose again three days later according to the scriptures which God the Holy Spirit had already declared. But its final absolute fulfillment is yet to be seen. And we are included in that part of God's perfect plan which is still being worked out in these our days. The Bible declares that Time itself is in God's hands. And we can see around us today plenty of evidence that time is moving to a remarkable end. Romans 11.25 tells us, I would not that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, Scripture is saying that there will be a day when his plan to draw his believing people to himself will be completed. And after the last Gentile has come to know and accept the Savior, God's immediate purpose will then return to deal directly with the Jewish people who are still his chosen people. But the following verse in Romans 11, which is verse 26, says, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and so all Israel shall be saved. And there's no biblical reason to support the theory that the word Israel there does not mean the actual physical nation of Israel, scattered as many of them still are around the world. God has not yet finished with the Jews, I'm sure you know that. And there is coming a day when their partial blindness will be removed, although through terribly difficult circumstances. But crucially for us, who are mostly not Jewish, that will be after the completion of God's plan with us. Way back in the sixth chapter of Genesis, God declares, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Surely implying there will be a time when it will be too late to be saved. You may occasionally come across someone. You may have someone very close to you in your family or someone that you know very well who has the air about them of being totally closed to the gospel. They've essentially made their decision. They've burned their boats. They're no longer open to the good news of salvation in Christ. 
Exodus chapter 10 verse 27 and in several other places throughout the book shows us clearly that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He was completely closed against what Moses had to say. In John 22 verse 40, Jesus, quoting from Isaiah 6, talks about God having blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they could not understand and they could not be converted. This is perhaps difficult to receive. But there obviously comes a point when a person passes the point of no return with regard to the extended grace of God in salvation. And there will be a time when it is too late to be saved. Because God's fullness of the Gentiles will have been completed. Each individual person we deal with, you evangelize, witness to, etc. Each of them, there will be a time where they pass the point of no return. But we don't know when that is. We have to treat them all as though they can all be saved. We have to witness to each and every person as though they're going to get saved today. I had some people in my family, my family have all gone now, thank the Lord, my mother and father are with the Lord, but not all my family went with the Lord, I, I don't think. There were family members who were closed, as far as I could tell, completely against the gospel of Christ. And that happens. It's a tragedy, but it happens. It's true, it's always been true for individuals, and it's also true that God's Spirit will one day declare the fullness of the Gentiles, and then judgment will fall. It will indeed be a fearful thing to be left behind at that time. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 declares, Now is the appointed time of salvation. This isn't intended to be an evangelistic message because I don't believe we need an evangelistic message in this congregation. But make note that the Bible says there will be a time when it will be too late. Our advice to everyone that we know should be, don't put it off. Don't leave it too late. God's plan for mankind, although interrupted by the intervention of Satan, which of course God already knew about, it will ultimately be completed with a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah spoke of it in Isaiah 65. It was seen in a vision in Revelation 21. And the Apostle Peter declares it as the final reality of all those who trust in Christ for salvation. In 2 Peter 3.13 he says, We, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So the creation promise when we were wonderfully made, is completed when we own him as personal saviour. And it will come to full realisation when he takes us home. This is the Christian hope. The only religion in the world, the only evangelical Bible-believing Christianity, which is the only kind of Christianity, all the rest is a sham, but evangelical, Bible-believing Christianity is the only religion in the world that gives you this hope, these three things. Where you have come from, why you are here, and where you are going. There is no other religion in the world that can answer those three questions. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. In these exciting but dangerous days, we have a security and an expectation that the world simply does not have. You can't find this security by working towards combating climate change. You can't find this security by recycling according to the council's instructions in all your different coloured bins. You can't find this security in politics or in the World Health Organization or in Mr. Schwab and all his demonic entities. You can't find that security anywhere else. Our eternal purpose is to God's further glory and one day we shall see him without the veil between. We will see his glory as it really is and then with his glory we will shine. 
As we seek earnestly to follow him and to actively move with his purpose and blessing in mind, we will reach the place where a translation into glory is just a step. Just as there's an old song, isn't there? One step from golden streets. One step from glory so sweet. So be encouraged. There is so much darkness in the world today. There's so much open sin in opposition to God's word, even within the churches. There's so much fear and so much anxiety, so much uncertainty, so much depression. All of these things brought on by a lack of understanding of why we're here, what our purpose is, where we came from, and most essentially, where we're going. We have a purpose. I know I've said that, I'm repeating myself, but that's the message today. We have a purpose, not because there's anything special in ourselves. Sorry to disappoint you if you thought that was the reason. It's not because there's anything special about you. It's not because you are more worthy than anybody else. But it's because you were fearfully and wonderfully made and bought with a price by the grace of God displayed in Jesus. Therefore, all things work together for good. Every moment of our experience counts for something and means something his guiding hand is in control we are free from the guilt of the past and we are free from the fear of the future just now our vision is blurred and some of the glory is obscured partly because we concentrate too much on what's happening to us we get disappointed and we get disillusioned and we get fearful because we, we see our situation and we think, I wonder what's going to happen next. How bad are things going to get? And the world is against us in almost every possible corner. And our vision is somewhat blurred. Like Mary in the garden when Jesus came to her immediately after the resurrection. Now, there are different ideas on this, and I can't say this is definitely it, but this is what I believe. She didn't recognize the Lord Jesus when he, she thought he was the gardener. You know the story, don't you? She'd seen him die. She'd seen the truth of the crucifixion. Imagine what that did to the woman. I mean, she loved this man. She'd walked with this man for some time. She knew him well. She trusted him and cared for him as a friend. She, he was very dear to her. She had witnessed this most terrible thing. The crucifix, death by crucifixion was a terrible thing for anyone. To see this innocent man who she cared about so much go through what he went through in front of her and not be able to do anything about it, we can't blame her for being upset. We can't blame her for being heartbroken. And I think the reason she didn't recognize him, one of the reasons she didn't recognize him, was because her vision was blurred, because she was crying. She was concentrating on the terrible thing that had happened. She was dwelling on the defeat. She was dwelling on the, the shattering of all her dreams. All her hopes had all come to nothing, apparently. And so she, her vision wasn't clear, and she didn't recognize him. But she recognized his voice. When he said her name, and that's apparently, that's the Bible tells us that's all he said. He just said, Mary. And she knew instantly the Savior had risen, just as he said he would. But she'd never understood it before. She recognized his voice. Every now and then, God is gracious to give us just a glimpse of his glory. We can't bear the fullness of his glory in these bodies, these frail bodies that, although wonderfully and marvelously made, don't work quite right. And they are still, you know, we can't bear the fullness of his glory in this life. But there's a day coming when the veil will be removed. We'll be given new bodies, which I can't wait for. 
which will be able to withstand the splendor of his presence. And in that new body, we will see him face to face as he is. And then, as an old hymn says, then we'll praise him as we really ought. When you consider that God, who is omniscient, all-knowing, and is outside of time, he knew the beginning from the end. And we see that this created world, this world in which we live, according to Isaiah 34, was never meant to be immortal. And people tell you we need to save the world. When they give you their latest plan on how they're going to save the world, I read something in the paper yesterday, some silly, ridiculous idea of saving the world. This world was never meant to be immortal. There was always going to be a time when this earth and the skies would be rolled up like a scroll. It was never meant to be immortal. There's always been a time scale. In the fullness of time, Christ came. In the fullness of time, he rose again, winning the spiritual victory over death. And in the fullness of time, he will return. That which was created and born again will be finally renewed. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Thank you.